good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are connecting from. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this new webinar on glossolan soil spectroscopy. My name is Julia Stanko. I'm sorry that my camera is off, but I experienced some issue with uh, my uh, camera settings just now, so I switch it off. Uh, I work for, for the FAO uh, Global Soil Partnership, and our webinar today takes us to Denmark, where our renowned speakers will introduce us to soil spectroscopy from an academic and private sector perspectives. We are very lucky as they will also show some practical examples of research projects and laboratory demonstrations. Before starting, I would kindly remind you that the session is organized in a webinar format in which participants cannot activate their audio and camera. However, participants are encouraged to post their question in the Q&A box which will be moderated by my colleagues. We will choose a few, a few questions to be answered live and the rest will be answered via chat. In addition, a chat box is available and can be used for interaction between participants. For any technical issue, please write directly to me on the chat and I will be happy to help. Before digging into soil spectroscopy with our renowned speakers, I will provide a bit of background on the Global Soil Partnership and Glossolan, the Global Soil Laboratory Network. So, the, one sec. the Global Soil Partnership towards healthy soil and sustainable soil management for all. What is the Global Soil Partnership? The Global Soil Partnership is a, a single and strong voice on soil issue. It is a mechanism and a partnership created to improve collaboration between uh, all stakeholders they, who dedicate their work to soil. It is a unique framework for exchange of experiences and discussion among all actors and is composed of seven regional soil partnerships, over 500 partner institutions worldwide, seven technical networks, and 161 national focal point from the uh, 197 FAO members. Public and private donors are supporting GSP action on the ground. Here you can see our ITPS, the Intergovernment Technical Panel on Soil, 27 soil experts providing scientific and technical advice to the GSP, the Plenary Assembly, the GSP main decision-making body, uh, that held its annual event uh, with FAO members and GSP partners to review and uh, prioritize all action. And then you, you can see in my slide also the areas of work of the Global Soil Partnership. Uh, Glossolan, the Global Soil Laboratory Network, uh, is one of the uh, seven technical network of the GSP established in 2017 to build and strengthen the capacity of laboratories worldwide in soil analysis and to respond to the need for harmonizing soil analytical data. 2017, here you have a short timeline. 2017, uh, Glossolan started to work on wet chemistry and focus mainly on training, uh, standard operating procedures, and the execution of uh, inter-laboratory comparisons. In 2020, there was the launch of the Glossolan Initiative on Soil Spectroscopy. In 2020, the related launch of the International Network of Fertilizer Analysis. And then here we are, 21-22, consolidation of the capacity development program and activities on spectroscopy through training, manual assessment, webinars, and video courses. So here we are now. Um, one second, okay. Uh, the Glossolan soil spectroscopy webinars, we had many also in 2021. This is the new cycle of 2022. Um, I will now give the floor to my colleague E, who will be moderating this session and introduce, we'll have the pleasure to introduce our today's speaker. 
y over to you. You are muted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Nicola. And uh, thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, brief uh, presentation to introduce uh, GSP's work and uh, what we are focusing on. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, Gross Launchback webinar of uh, this year. My name is uh, Yipen from Global Soul Partnership FEO. I'm coordinating activities related to soil spectroscopy, soil data and uh, information in general. As probably you know from our previous uh, webinar that uh, one of the main objectives of uh, Global on Spec is to help countries build their capacities on the development of uh, soil spectroscopy in order to facilitate the soil monitoring and uh, sustainable soil management. This is also why last year we decided to run this webinar and invite the advanced institute institutions to share their knowledge and uh, experiences on the topic of uh, soil spectroscopy and uh, soil mapping. Today we have invited our colleagues from Aarhus University Denmark to share their stories during the last 15 years, how they developed their soil spectral lab, National Soil Spectral Library, and how they explored the capability of this technology in soil application. Today is also a bit personal for me because I did my PhD in this group 10 years ago and I closely worked with Dr. Maria Canada since 2011. In the meantime, today's webinar is also slightly different compared to before because we will have two speakers. Another speaker is Dr. Nicola Bork from one Danish spectrometer manufacturer called FOSS. Since 2013, it was the ending period of my PhD study, actually. Argus University started to work with FOSS for further development of soil spectroscopy at national scale. So we worked together, built the second generation of the Danish soil spectral library, developed a national model for different soil properties. Until now, Aarhus University and the FOSS are still closely working together on the development of soil spectroscopy. Again, this experience is also a, little, a, a bit personal for me because I was in a part of this journey back on that time. So I really appreciated this experience as well. So I think it would be really nice to share this story to the world, how research institute can work with a spectrometer manufacturer and develop their capacities for different soil spectroscopy application. Without further ado, I will pass floor to today's first speaker, Dr. Maria Canada. In the meantime, we would li like to introduce uh, Dr. Cecily Hammerson. She will be in the panelist today to help with you and your questions. So please feel free to raise your questions in the Q&A box. Maria, floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Lee, um, for this very nice introduction. And yeah, hello, everyone. Um, let me just put up my presentation. So you should be able now to see the first slide. Yes, go ahead. Good. Yes. So um, first of all, I would like to say thank you very much for the invitation. I feel really privileged to, to be a part of, of the um, training workshops that you're organizing. I think it's a really, really nice initiative. It's also nice to see you here in slightly different constellation after some years. Um, so yeah, I, I'm here to, to share our experience with um, soil spectroscopy and application of, of spectroscopy to, to different activities we have in our department. And as he already mentioned, I have uh, Cecilia Hermesen, my good colleague uh, with me, who will be helping um, answering the questions during the presentation. And she has been also involved in, in a lot of uh, spectroscopy activities uh, we have. So during the presentation, I will uh, first, um, start to tell you a little bit about the department uh, where where we're working um, and why we're interested in soil spectroscopy. And I will also show you the instrumentation that we have available 
and um, how we are using the instrumentation. So the data set, the spectral library that we have um, developed. And of course, the aims of the library are to, to use them, the, the, the data sets. So I will show you some examples uh, of different applications. And I will finish um, telling you a little bit about our teaching activities. The Department of Agroecology um, is actually uh, located in different uh, areas of, of Denmark. Um, so we have research facilities in Folum, which you can see on the on the picture here, and um, also in uh, Flakebia. And uh, we have teaching activities mainly in, in Aarhus, and we have also uh, research stations in other places. So we, we are in, um, uh, distributed in, in different areas um, of Denmark. Uh, the main activities, of course, are research. We are uh, part of university. Um, we also have um, activities related to policy support. And this is where, where we get certain questions uh, from the ministry that we have to answer. Um, and sometimes we need to conduct research, uh, further research in order to be able to, to answer them. So this is also quite a big part of, of our work. Um, we also have education programs for bachelor students and, and masters within agrobiology. Um, and we are also uh, partners in the international Erasmus Mundus uh, master program uh, within soils and, and global threats. And finally, I mean, we, we do a lot of collaboration and this is of course, not only in Denmark with other institutions, um, companies, as you will hear in a moment about, um other other universities but also um a lot of international collaboration so when it comes to to the staff uh, agroecology is, is 270 employees um whereas around 60 i think are phd students and the group which i'm um, affiliated with uh, we are 40 in total and eight um senior researchers um, within the uh, department we have several different sections that are working with with different um, uh, topics related to our agroecology um, so i've just listed them here but i will not talk uh, more about this uh, i will instead focus about the soil physics and hydropedology group which in short we call soil this is the, the group that i'm affiliated with and um, within this group, we also have a lot of different activities. Uh, we, we do research within um, Arctic soils, um, digital soil mapping, soil quality, soil mechanical behavior, um, also sustainable soil management and, and water and contaminant transport. And finally, we also work with soil spectroscopy. And I'm responsible for, for the activities um, within this area. And here we, we work with NIR spectroscopy, which is the main topic of, of this presentation, but we also uh, work with mid-infrared range and laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. So the group that is working with uh, spectroscopy is quite dynamic. Uh, at this point, we have um, uh, some master students, PhDs and postdocs, and since it is um, a lot of students that are involved, then of course there is quite a dynamic because Students come and go, uh, sometimes stay. So we do have, um, like I said, postdocs as well. So why, why at all are we looking into spectroscopy? Um, I think it's a similar reason why everybody else uh, does. And this is because we simply need um, more and more soil data. And this is on different scales from local field scale to, to regional and national. And it's, it's difficult to, um, to catch up with this demand when we use only conventional ways of analyzing soil. So we go, of course, after some other alternatives, in this case, sensing uh, techniques. And in the department, we use different sensors, not only um, spectroscopy. Um, I'll be talking about NIR only. Um, but we also want to use this technique to actually be able to estimate some properties maybe a little bit better. Um, and this is mainly for properties that otherwise in the lab would be difficult to, to, or to, to be estimated um, repeatedly with the same precision. So rather complicated properties. And the, the last two points I put here are rather uh, related to proximal soil sensing in the field or remote sensing where we are interested in gathering more, more data 
um, on a bigger scale or maybe in the areas where we cannot access. So in the department, we have um, different instrumentation available. Uh, we have uh, spectrometers that are uh, used in the laboratory and in the field. In the lab, we are using mainly two. Uh, we have DS2500. This is the process instrument. Uh, I will not talk too much about it because uh, Dr. Nikolai Bork will introduce you more uh, to this instrumentation and will show it as well. Um, but this is, in, in short, it's an NIR, visible NIR sensor coloring spectral range from 400 to 2000 nanometers, 2500 nanometers. Um, and um, we are using this um, special sample cup for, for um, measurement. And we can do measurements in several locations. So the sample is actually rotating while we are taking the measurement. So we can get a nice representation of the soil. Um, the next instrument is uh, LabSpec. It's quite common actually among uh, soil spectroscopists. Um, it's an ASD instrument that we don't use as frequently. And we usually use it when we need to do measurements on intact soils. Because we have this device called um, probe. Contact probe. For field instrumentation, um, we have various shank and profiler system. So it's the same company that has manufactured them. Um, the first one here, mounted by by a tractor, uh, pulled by a tractor. It's on the special uh, toolbox, um, and it's actually quite special um, model where we have not only an IR spectrometer, um, where we do the measurements through the shank, which is uh, lowered in the soil here. We have a small sapphire window at the bottom for which we illuminate the soil. We also have cultural electrodes. So that's an additional sensor that we can use here. So we get uh, readings for electrical conductivity. And we also have a temperature sensor. So at the same time while driving, we can record three types of sensing uh, measurements uh, together with GPS coordinates. And the profiler system, as the name indicates, is a system that is uh, doing measurements on the profile scale. So this is where we are inserting uh, this rod in the soil and doing measurements um, while inserting. Uh, here you have the small sapphire window. We have not been using this system that much. We have a bit of problems with, so uh, with sandy uh, soils and uh, some of the soils where we have a lot of stones. So it's difficult to actually insert uh, the rod in the soil. So this is the instrumentation, of course, for all those instruments, we have developed our um, protocols on how to prepare the soils, how to set up the instruments, um, how to extract the samples after the, the, the measurements, um, information on um, standards that we're using. Uh, so it has been years of, of work of, of different um, people involved in this. So let's go to, to some examples. Um, now uh, here, uh, I would like to talk about how we established a spectral library um, of, of Danish soils. So at the very beginning, um, we have selected some soils from our soil archive. We are very fortunate because we have thousands of soil samples in our archive and they also have wet chemistry available. Um, so we have selected some representative soils and scanned them with ASD instrument and sort of established this first database for, for analysis. And we have conducted several um, studies using this data set. I will show you one a little bit later. Um, in the next phase, we have actually rescanned this library with a FOSSES instrument, DS2500. And this was in relation to our collaboration project, uh, which was dedicated to the application of soil spectroscopy for soil quality uh, assessment. And in this project, we had um, Aarhus University, where we had already some experience with spectral libraries. We had uh, soils, we had reference data, and FOSS um, had the instrumentation. And we also had a third partner, which was a Danish uh, consultancy a company for farmers, which was um, supposed to disseminate the, the, the results of the project so that we could uh, also uh, inform, for example, uh, end users, farmers and advisors um, about this technique. And so we were trying to be as visible as possible and uh, attending conferences where we knew where uh, farmers are also coming. So we have prepared, we cannot see it, and this is actually in Danish. Um, this was um, a, a poster that was 
a summarizing for the farmers um, idea about soil spectroscopy and how to use it. And we also made demonstrations using the sensors showing how, how quickly we can make estimations of uh, basic soil properties. So the spectra library is um, quite extensive. If you think about Denmark, which is a very small country, um, so we have scanned several data sets available in our soil archive. Uh, I put the map here that is colored according to soil types um, in Denmark. So you can see the distribution of the points and how well we are actually representing the entire country. So yeah, we have soil profile investigation. These were samples from 1980s. Um, and these are the samples on a several kilometer grid. These are small points you can see across the country. and they are also at different depths, so it's actually um, approximately four depths per point. We have uh, data from soil classification databases, highly dense points you can see here, um, where we have points at two different depths, uh, topsoils and subsoils. We have also a lowland database. Um, it's actually not on the map, apologies. Um, and several field investigations, the bigger points you can see here, uh, those dots, these are fields where we have intensively um, sampled. And we also have samples from other countries, from Greenland, for example, we, we keep on actually adding uh, more from, from Greenland because we have uh, quite many activities there, and also from, from other countries around the world. So this is, this is our sort of basis and we keep on actually uh, enlarging this spectral library with every new project that we are uh, running. So let's go to some examples because I guess that this is most interesting. Um, this is this is one of the first examples uh, of the application of the first database that we established on LabSpec. And this is where we use the uh, square grid data um, and only topsoils only spectra information. So the idea was that we wanted to see if spectra only can actually tell us something about soils in Denmark. Um, so we performed principal component analysis um, of the spectra information and we got um, PC scores from the first three pieces that we have mapped. So we have a map of PC1, PC2 and PC3. And already here you can see that there's a very nice, um, there are some trends uh, behind, behind those uh, colors. And if you correspond these maps to the loadings from the principal component analysis, you could see, for example, that the first PC um, had um, quite high loadings within the region that is uh, correlated with organic matter. And this is also what we know that we usually have more organic matter in, in this area of, of the country. Oppositely, for example, PC2 um, has, um, let me see, PC2 is the red line here. Uh, it has responses from OH bonds and some iron oxides, um, so mainly from clay mineralogy. Um, and this is also what we know about the initial section. So already just a simple PC map could, could tell us a lot. And the last uh, PC3 was um, a little bit of, of both. It also didn't explain as much variability, so I will not discuss it in details. In the next step, we have clustered this, um, these three maps and um, got this um, sort of very simplified uh, cell classification map of, of Denmark. Um, you can see also here, there is a plot with mean spectrum from each of those clusters. And these are continuum removed spectra, so it's not uh, a row re reflectance. Um, and just as an example, again, the blue cluster here, or dark blue rather, um, had responses from ion oxides and the highest responses in areas where we know we have um, information from clay mineralogy. And if we take, for example, cluster four, the green one here, it has um, the highest responses from organic matter. Um, and if I put again this tiny map of Danish soils, you can actually see similarities, uh, which correspond very well to what we already know about Danish soils. You can say, of course, that this very um, simple uh, classification map from NIR is, is, is much simpler, but this is also because we used only approximately 600 points to, to come up with this map, whereas um, this map is based on, I think, about 30,000 points. So it's, it's much uh, fine resolution. So this was just an example of sort of more qualitative analysis using uh, spectra. 
And um, from now on, I will show you some examples uh, with uh, quantitative um, modeling results. Um, this first one is uh, where we used NIR for the estimation of basic soil properties um, and the soil properties that we know that are spectrally active um, in the near infrared range. So it was a study where we had um, quite many different uh, fields across Denmark, also actually one field from Greenland. You can see here the texture triangle, what texture classes were represented. And so we have modeled clay content, um, organic carbon content, and the plots that you will be seeing, you can, you can see that in the x-axis, there's always reference values and y-axis would represent the predicted uh, values. So again, the first model for clay content, I will not talk about R squares or errors, they are actually on the, on the plots, but it's, I would rather that you focus on the fit and how the samples be, uh, behave uh, um, along one-to-one -one line. Um, and so organic carbon uh, model, both um, good fits. There is a bit of issue here in higher range of clay content, but the overall model is good. And we added also here a model for Dexter N. It's a ratio of clay over organic carbon, which is a very good indicator for soil fertility. So um, it can tell what conditions, what structural condition the soil is depending on, on the number. So if, if N is below 10, we have non-complex organic carbon uh, present and it's rather good structure and good tilth conditions. And oppositely, if the N value is above 10, we have uh, non-complex clay and it represents soils that, that are of uh, degraded soil structure. So you can see actually that the model that is um, representing the clay to o uh, OC ratio is even better than the other two uh, models, which was very interesting for us uh, to find out. And we hypothesized that that's most likely because in this model, we are using information from both um, soil organic carbon and um, clay. The next example is um, from a project where we wanted to push spectroscopy a little bit further. And instead of looking into properties that are spectrally active, we wanted to um, estimate rather so functional properties, which are dependent on the spectrally active properties like so organic carbon and, and uh, clay content or mineralogy. So in this case, we wanted to estimate different soil properties that are important for risk assessment of contaminant transport. So all the properties that are telling us something about soil filtering function. And I have listed for you some of them that we have um, estimated. Uh, so these were structural properties, like microporosity, city metrics, surface properties, like specific surface area, water repellency, transport uh, and binding as well, including sorption coefficient. And I forgot to tell you from the beginning that every time I talk about uh, a study, I put actually an asterisk with a number. And at the end of the presentation, we have a list of all the papers where we have actually published these results. So now I'll just show you some examples from this uh, project. Uh, for the structure properties. So, I mean, structure, um, so structure is, is, is defined as the spatial arrangement of pores and particles um, networks in the soil. And uh, it's controlled by soil properties, by climate, um, soil, crop management as well. It's, it's a very important um, uh, property to know. And in this study, we have used an X-ray, computer tomography, CT scanning that you might know from the hospital, um, to uh, derive the soil pore network um, status. And you can see here the picture of soil columns. Um, for example, universal soil that is a sandy soil, very few pores not well connected, and volvia soil, um, which is um, much well uh, better structured with many pores well connected. So we have derived two parameters here, city matrix, which is a density of soil without the pores and without the stones, and microporosity, um, which consists of uh, pores bigger than 1.2 uh, millimeter in diameter. And here are the results. At the top, we have a modeling of microporosity. So again, measured versus predicted and the corresponding regression coefficient. And at the bottom, you have a model for city matrix. Uh, and the corresponding regression coefficient. So 
So you can see again without any numbers that the uh, macro porosity was not uh, very well predicted. It, it was actually not a reliable model. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, however, if we compare the results from this model with uh, Peter transfer functions that uh, are usually used to derive uh, this property, spectroscopy still performed actually better. Um, for CT matrix, you can see that we actually were able to establish a very good uh, correlation. The next um, actual property is the specific surface area. And that is also very important. Um, and it governs a lot of other um, processes in the soil that are important for important for water retention and movement, also for um, contaminants um, dynamics and, and nutrients as well. Oops. Um, so here we use the big data set with um, a lot of samples actually from different continents. Uh, you can see again, we have a very um, um, nice distribution if it comes to soil texture. And we have um, uh, divided our data set into calibration and validation. And the top model is actually the model where we have um, calibration results for specific surface area. Um, and the bottom is the validation. So it's it's actually a very promising model. Again, um, it's a very big variability we are dealing with, so it's with different mineralogy. Um, and we actually consider it, it uh, very promising. The next parameter in this model that uh, in this project that we were modeled was contaminant uh, binding. Um, and it was on a field scale, but we have actually also one um, on uh, um, a bigger scale examples that uh, Cecilia Emerson has published from New Zealand. And we have one in um, um, that was just sent for revision, which is on a national scale. Here we have been looking into the sorption of um, two different contaminants. Um, I mean, sorption um, in addition to degradation and, and then transport uh, controls the mobility of contaminants in the soil. So a very important uh, property to know. And this is also, it's, it's governed by other so, so properties and um, includes texture, organic matter, oxides, for example. And here is the model for um, KD, so sorption coefficient for glyphosate that you know from Roundup, it's a known herbicide. And you can see the seeds from the reference and the predicted uh, plot. It's actually a very nice correlation. Uh, you can ask why we were able to estimate it with, with spectroscopy. I mean, it's not spectrally active property, but it binds strongly to iron and aluminum oxides and phosphorus. Phosphorus is not spectrally active, but um, the other two are, and that's why we were able to establish this good correlation. The other uh, contaminant was phenantrine and its sorption coefficient. It's an PAH uh, that originates from, from combustion. And we got even better uh, correlation for this uh, property. And that's due to the fact that it binds strongly to organic matter, which is strongly um, related to different regions in NIR and actually also visible um, region of the spectrum. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is another project uh, where we were using spectroscopy for the estimation of engineering properties. And these were Attenberg limits. You have a small uh, figure at the top here showing you how the soil mechanical behavior is changing or uh, yeah, how the consistency limits are changing with increased water content. In this study, we have um, looked into plastic limits. So where the soil is changing from semi-solid to plastic phase and then liquid limits. So when it becomes liquid and also plasticity index, uh, which is simply the difference of the two. And again, um, a big data set, actually international data set. Um, the top plots are uh, calibration plots for liquid limit, plastic limit, and um, plasticity index. Um, good uh, correlation, maybe the lowest you could say here for, for, for the PI. But the validation um, also shows actually a lot of um, promising results or we can uh, still establish a good correlation and we're able to estimate 
these properties um, good and actually not significantly different than if we would do them using Peter transfer functions. And finally, I think I have to speed up actually. Um, I would like to mention um, our field applications. Um, since I showed you the sensor, we also work in the field. Uh, I talked about how, how uh, the sensor is built. So um, we used this platform to map two fields. We've been driving around, uh, I've seen those trim lines here, very dense, uh, and what appears for you most likely like lines is actually points where we collected spectral and EC data and temperature data. And after we have collected all this data, we use spectral information to, um, to, to be compressed. We use principal component analysis and then cluster the data to select representative samples for calibration purposes. So, the representative samples are the black triangles. This is where we went to collect samples. Then we send them to the laboratory for wet chemistry analysis. And yes, we still need wet chemistry analysis. We cannot go around. Um, once we got the results, we established calibration models for carbon and texture. And these models were used to uh, predict all the remaining points that we have gathered for, for the uh, both fields. Once we had those prediction points, we uh, map them into those prediction maps of organic carbon, clay content, silt, and sand. Um, so that's just one of the examples how, how spectroscopy can be used in the field. But of course, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, we have very unstable conditions as opposed to how it is in the field, uh, in the lab. Um, and we have moisture content, uh, which is actually probably one of the biggest problems. And in the same line, I would like to tell you a little bit about the uh, project that we have uh, initiated in November last year. It's a European joint program on soil where we got funded a project called Probefield with a very long title, which I'm not going to read. Um, but this is a project um, led by SLU and Bo Steinberg, uh, who was also giving a webinar, I think at the very first webinar. Uh, I'm co-leading and then we have 14 partners and 12 countries and you can see here on the map the countries that are involved and because they represent the availability of spectral libraries um, for, from those countries. Um, so the main aim is to do measurements with uh, soil spectroscopy in the field um, best as, as, as good as possible. So first we are uh, developing methodology in the field to collect spectra which are as little affected as uh, possible by moisture. Then we're applying different uh, methods, mathematical methods to remove moisture from the spectra and also try to combine these spectra with uh, spectral libraries we have developed because these are actually developed on dry soils. So there's a lot of fine tuning and figuring how we can apply this to field uh, measurements. There will be also some work on um, sensor fusion and 3D field estimation as well. So, so we are expecting to have a final protocol of the best practice for field application. And now I would like to finish uh, with a few words about our testing activities. So we're trying to put spectroscopy in all sort of uh, soil courses we have at least a little bit so the students get acquainted. Uh, but we also have a dedicated course for soil spectroscopy. Um, uh, it's a PhD course and it's uh, both a combination of theoretical um, lectures and a lot of hands-on experience. So the students get to use the sensors that we have, they collect their own data, then they work with the data on the computers to do some both qualitative and quantitative analysis. Uh, so we first time uh, organized it last year and we have um, external lecturers here, both Steinberg and Johanna Bettelin from SLU. Then we also took some lectures ourselves um, with Cecilia and then a colleague, Anna Smula. And we had a guest lecturer, I.R. Bendor, who introduced uh, the students to remote sensing. So as I said, this is the list of all the uh, publications that uh, I have been referring to with uh, showing the results. Um, but I would like to finish with this slide and acknowledge the spectroscopy team. It's all the students, uh, PhDs, masters, postdocs that have been involved in, in the spectroscopy work since I started back in 2008. Um, and I didn't get to show all the work, but here you have the names. And if you 
yeah, if you are interested to hear more stories about how we use spectroscopy, you can you can Google their names and, and find some more um, applications. So with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have uh, any questions, please uh, put them in the QR section. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Maria. Very nice presentation. And uh, I would suggest you uh, one slide so with all these publications so you can uh, share it in the chat box because I oh, saw yeah. some colleagues uh, they were asking the publication yes. or et cetera. And uh, second is uh, you can see I choose a couple of questions to answer live or later so you can read a little bit and then later we can bring it to the discussion. Yes, yeah. that sounds good. Um, yes, yeah. thank you. Yes. So now I would like to pass the floor to the Dr. Nikolai Bok to introduce uh, the soil spectroscopy development uh, from a manufacturer point of view. Please, floor is yours, Nikolai. Thank you, Yi. Um, I will share my presentation immediately. I hope you can see it. So um, yes. good. So uh, yeah, as uh, you mentioned, uh, Maria and uh, and and Yi and Foss have uh, a long history together, and it's been uh, it has been a, a a journey, a very educational journey, I think, for both uh, for both the uh, university and uh, this uh, uh, instrument manufacturer. And I think that's uh, that's an interesting story uh, that might inspire some uh, similar projects out in the world. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the, the history of FOSS and Aarhus University is about 10 years old and, and it's, uh, it's stronger than ever, the collaboration, so it's, um, it's always a pleasure to be able to make a joint project and also to uh, share uh, this story. Uh, this particular presentation, uh, since Maria has been so kind to present, shall we say, the technical findings, which uh, our instrument is, is based on, uh, I have taken the uh, perspective to, uh, to, uh, uh, to explain how a commercial company, an instrument manufacturer, looks at uh, soil spectroscopy, what, what we see, what kind of potential we see in the market, and, and why we are interested in, in the first place. Um, I think I have an, an outline. Um, yeah, and first and foremost, I would like to introduce FOSS uh, to those who doesn't know it, uh, then talk a bit about the market um, and uh, what we can do for soil testing and then to summarize uh, in, in the end. So um, FOSS is a company uh, about uh, founded in 1956 by this guy in to the left, Niels Foss. Um, and we have throughout uh, our more than 60 year old history been producing instruments for measuring uh, various properties uh, related to food and agriculture. Um, we have a whole range of different instruments. As you can see, uh, they, they have evolved a little bit uh, over time, and, uh, but I think that they are clearly among the uh, cutting edge instruments of the, uh, of the industry. Um, we have both benchtop instruments, as you can see most of them here, but we also have, have, have instruments that belong in a process environment for, uh, for manufacturing uh, milk and, and, and grain products and all sorts of things. Um, it is, uh, by, by, by all means, high tech, tech instruments we produce uh, based on a couple of core technologies. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, without a doubt, spectroscopy is the core technology. Um, near infrared NIR is probably the uh, our, our our largest strength, but we also have a, a several instruments using the mid infrared or FTIR range, uh, and we even have X-ray instruments in the field. Uh, those instruments, uh, any 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 good instrument is not just a piece of measurement technology. It is it comes packaged so that the user can actually interpret the data easily. Uh, so we use uh, a lot of uh, shall we say. Uh, additional technologies to, to make the data easily accessible to the end user. Um, <clears throat> a 
as mentioned, we have uh, it is food and agriculture that is the uh, the heart of our products, and uh, uh, there is a range of different, shall we say, what we call uh, customer segments: uh, milk, wine, meat, feed, uh, and and grain. And then we have the the um, shall we say a a, a unifying uh, customer segment, which is a laboratory, a larger uh, research or commercial laboratory doing uh, tests. And this is actually uh, where uh, the soil activities in FOSS are located, since the soil testing, uh, generally speaking, are conducted in larger research or commercial laboratories. Um, briefly, FOSS is a family-owned company in Denmark, but we have a global presence uh, with most of our turnover outside Denmark. About uh, 300 million euros uh, last year was a turnover, and I think we are around 1,500 employees. So we are by no means a small uh, company, although there are bigger, we are a very well consolidated company. And as can be seen here, we have a global presence with the uh, uh, FOSS uh, companies in most of the world and FOSS distributors covering uh, the rest of the world. So uh, wherever you are in the world, it will be possible to both buy and service a FOSS instrument. Um, going on to how we see the soil testing market from, shall we say, both a, a, a combined technical and commercial uh, viewpoint. Um, the motivation, I think we share that with everybody else. Uh, there is an increasing population and of course the use of, uh, or the, the, and, and we all need food. So we need to, um, to manage our soil uh, well to, uh, to be able to produce enough food. And uh, the good old saying, if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. It certainly applies to soil as well. Um, the problem um, for the, the problem for some is that uh, the very many soil analysis methods they are slow and labor intensive and they use a lot of chemicals and they are uh, most of them are actually from the first half of the 20th century uh, although it should be said that several are actually quite a bit older than that so while there is a pressing need to analyze soil then the methods to, to analyze them are actually quite outdated. Uh, that is, of course, a, an opportunity for a company as FOSS where we want to go in and offer a better solution. So this is both a challenge and an opportunity as we see it. Um, the development of the soil testing market follows the, the, the actually the, the, the trend in, in food production and in, in population. Uh, there's an, we see an annual growth of about 10, 15 percent. Um, that is not exactly matched with the growth in, in the number of laboratories because many laboratories, they have a tendency to consolidate um, simply because larger testing facilities are more efficient than smaller ones. Um, but this increase in, in soil testing is driven by, uh, of course, the desire for soil management um, to increase the yield, uh, but there are also legislation that, uh, that in many countries, um, actually, uh, it is mandatory to perform soil analysis in order to be allowed to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to fertilize the field at all. And uh, also, there are a couple of very interesting megatrends that are pushing on this development as well. So all in all, it is very interesting for a, a company like FOSS to, to enter the soil testing market, although it is, uh, it is not where we've had our main focus uh, for the, on, until about a decade ago. Touching a little bit on these uh, megatrends, I find them quite uh, interesting. Uh, the concept of precision farming has gained more and more uh, traction over the last few decades. Uh, simply due to the perspective that, that a real soil map or a, 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 the real soil might look like something in the lower left corner, where, but, but that is a, for most practical purposes inaccessible to the farmer because that many soil analysis are, are not available. Rather, they have to settle for something that looks like something in the upper right corner with a much lower precision and a much poorer understanding of the soil. Of course, more testing will give a more precise uh, understanding of the soil and, and a better 
utilization of the soil. I've put some company logos on projects that are ongoing, not all related to FOSS, um, but just to give an impression that these are some really large players looking into this. Um, a more recent, but uh, uh, perhaps even more pressing mega trend is the concept of CO2 sequestration in soil. Uh, it's quite uh, well known, I should say, that uh, there's uh, too much CO2 in the atmosphere. And also, as uh, Maria mentioned, there is actually too little uh, carbon in the soil. So the idea to take some of the excess carbon from the atmosphere and put it into the soil uh, is seen as a win-win concept. And I really believe it is. Um, there will be less uh, global warming and there'll be a healthier soil. Um, and for instance, Microsoft has put in, I believe it was around a billion dollars to actually buy, uh, to actually um, pay farmers to put in the carbon into the soil and thereby take it out of the atmosphere. But of course, there's a large documentation uh, requirement in order to, to document that this carbon is actually into the soil and is simply managing this vast amount of soil uh, analysis for carbon uh, is, is a real challenge using the existing methods. Um, so what, what are those? One might ask if you're not familiar with it, um, a normal uh, soil is taken from dock out of the field and transported to a, a laboratory where it is, uh, it is dock, it is uh, uh, registered. Um, then there is a sample preparation step, which is generic for all soils and through all of the world with very little uh, uh, differences. And that is to dry the soil using normally just a conventional oven uh, overnight. Um, and then to sieve it, to get rid of uh, rocks and uh, insects and, and leaves and, and other particles that are, uh, per that definition, not part of the soil. Um, then the sample is split into several fractions where the individual analysis then uh, is, is conducted using some specific additional soil preparation method. But this drying and sieving is a generic soil preparation method that is um, and, and that's an important point for soil spectroscopy um, because um, that is actually the only sample preparation that is needed. I'll come back to that. Then the results are generated in a report and sent back to the farmer. So this is a quite, it, it can often take several days, even a week, if you, if you require some specific um, samples. So it is not by no, by no means a fast process. Uh, the report, here's a soil report. Uh, this is a bit of flashy one <laughs> with some nice colors, but the point is that there is a soil chemistry and soil physics and soil biology uh, part uh, often. Um, and, um, and, the soil and, and the spectroscopy can, can help with not all of these, but in particular with the soil physical parameters. Um, to the left is a little bit less flashy, but perhaps more, uh, more, uh, more normal uh, report where you have just a huge amount of uh, parameters that can, that can be analyzed. Um, and, and most of them uh, uh, cannot be analyzed with, uh, with spectroscopy. But, um, and these parameters, they are site dependent and crop dependent and season dependent. And the spectroscopy can tackle, as mentioned, a few of them, but some very central parameters. The soil organic carbon, uh, is probably the most interesting one from, from our perspective. Um, but we have also the clay, silt, and sand. That's the texture class uh, being a, a, a well-documented and well-known parameter that, that spectroscopy can analyze. And furthermore, also a parameter such as pH and uh, CEC being the cation exchange capacity. Um, there can also be several others that can be analyzed. Here I just take, took a few uh, key ones. And to the left here uh, in this table are, are some accuracies that uh, I will not dig further into. Um, I will not talk, shall we say, specifics, but I will come back to the accuracy. What is the expected accuracy of soil testing uh, compared to conventional testing? Because that's actually a very interesting, but not easy question. So uh, given that this is how it looks today, what can FOSS uh, offer? Um, and uh, the main product that we have to offer this is our top line spectrometer. Uh, 
It is uh, the uh, DS3, which is the, pre which is the um, newest generation uh, of our DS instruments, um, and also the instrument type that Maria has been using uh, with good results. And it has a wavelength range, uh, the complete wavelength range from, um, from including the visual up to the all, all of the near infrared, um, which gives a lot of uh, a lot of options. And in many cases, one might be able to use a, a narrower wavelength range. Um, but this entire wavelength range that certainly gives all the options that one can imagine within uh, near spectroscopy. Another uh, unique feature, I dare say, is that our instruments, they are uh, standardized to an extent that, that nobody else, no, no other instrument in this world, they are identical, our instruments. So comparing results from one instrument in one part of the world to another instrument in another part of the world requires absolutely no uh, spectral adjustment, modification, standardization, anything. They are standardized already. So for instance, in a concept of uh, academia sharing data, that is just sending the data back and forth, then it is completely accessible as is. Furthermore, it's, uh, it is yeah, IP65, which can be nice in, a, in an industrial, in a, in a, in a, a soil laboratory, which can, which can be a bit dusty. Um, it is, as, as, as any spectrometer, fast and easy to use once it has, uh, yeah, once, once you, you understand how to use it. Um, and finally, uh, FOSS, I think we have, we have some, some unique digital services and calibration software so that when you have all these uh, soil spectra and want to do something with them, our software is, uh, I think, um, the easiest to use in the market. Um, I have a small video, which I cannot, uh, for technical reasons, present from my computer, but it will be shown uh, um, after my presentation here, just demonstrating the uh, instrument, uh, how it's used. Um, but as mentioned, an instrument is not uh, a product in FOSS's, uh, from FOSS's point of view. Um, you need to have, of course, an instrument is a very important thing, but also the digital services. It, uh, so you can manage the data, you can develop the calibration and you can uh, share data. There is a lot of the training. We have several training videos, how to use uh, FOSS's equipment. We have uh, developed a, uh, uh, for soil in uh, especially we've developed an application guide, which is a document on around 15 pages or so, which is designed to easily get a, 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 a inexperienced user uh, going with respect to both spectro uh, soil test, soil spectroscopy and calibration. And then finally, we have a, uh, a starter data, which is for the user who doesn't have access as uh, Maria does, uh, and, and probably many others also, to vast amounts of uh, spectra and reference data. So we have something to get uh, a, a new, um, a new, uh, shall we say, project started, um, which is uh, not global data as such, but, uh, but it is uh, certainly something that can help in getting uh, some quicker results. Um, so um, I will just uh, end my, my presentation here with some example, which we have with a, uh, on, on, on so we say a practical example from a major soil lab. Um, I just have some, um, on, uh, uh, on, on demonstrating the, so we say both the quality of the calibration, but also the usability of, a, um, of, of, of soil spectroscopy. And that was that's, this was a commercial laboratory. I can say that who were used to do it in the old-fashioned way with the combustion methods and with the chemical oxidation, but they wanted to have something that was easier and with the fewer chemicals. But they were, of course, as anybody else, uh, uh, cautious. Well, could this actually produce results that were good enough for their purpose? Um, and the main parameter, as mentioned, was soil organic carbon and uh, cutting over all of these, I would say, uh, 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 with the, all the spectra, this and that, going straight to the, to the result, we found that there was a, 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 an error, of course, on both, on, on the NIR, we could uh, document that, which was on the order of 0.4-ish 
um, percent absolute on the soil organic carbon level. And this was soil organic carbon typically in the range between zero to 10 percent. Um, and um, we were, of course, curious to hear the lab. Well, what do you think about this? Is this a good result to you? Do you need higher accuracy or is this, uh, is, is this something that, that you can use for your customers? And they were actually very happy with it because they knew from their inter own internal, uh, internal and external um, ring test that their own error was on the order of 0.31. And of course, um, using uh, the, 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 the instrument result as a, a calibration, um, um, what's it called? Um, the, the, the calibration, uh, the, the basis for the calibrations only, shall we say, adding 0.08% uh, to the error was very impressive. Um, so, um, of course, there were some outliers to the data, but it was interesting to, to, um, to, for us to investigate, well, well, where is the error? An outlier, that is, if you have a, 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 a spectroscopy prediction that says something that is completely different from the reference result. Uh, and then we analyze them. We've, normally, that is not so easy for a commercial laboratory, but we were so fortunate that it, they were able to retrieve the samples and reanalyze them using the uh, uh, reference method. And we actually found that in all of the cases we analyzed, it was the reference value that were incorrect. Um, and um, that was, uh, I wouldn't say it was a, a shock, but it was certainly something that, that was uh, thought provoking that, um, that, that it is a completely normal thing in a laboratory where you analyze thousands of samples to have errors on some of the samples. And that can be weighing, or it can be something to do with the, the data transfer, um, but it can also certainly be to the fact that you have to downsample the uh, method. So, uh, and downsample being uh, that you have, you have your, your sample coming from the field, which might be a kilo of soil or something like that, where you have to extract only about one gram of, uh, for the reference methods, but where for the spectroscopy methods, as, as, as can be seen in, in the video, you use a much larger mass of soil, several hundred grams. So this downsampling effect uh, is, is really a, a major source of error, we believe. Speaking a little bit about the origin of error, source of error, it, is, it, it should be noted that um, while the reference method is, shall we say, per definition correct, because that is the reference method, um, then uh, th there, and, and comparing that the uh, NIR or any spectroscopy method for that matter, matter is a secondary method, and there is by definition an additional uh, a, a source of error there. Uh, I've explained before that it, that it was in this case only a marginal source of error, so it was not, shall we say, something um, critical. Then we have for the sample preparation, um, most, most spectroscopy method, methods, and but in particular near-infrared spectroscopy, requires no additional sample preparation beyond the standard sample preparation of the laboratory being drying and sieving typically at two millimeters. No, no other sample preparation is needed. You have, uh, you have that, um, the sample prepared in that way. You simply scoop it into the cup and you measure it and you're done in one minute, no more. Uh, many reference methods and certainly for, uh, for soil organic carbon requires some quite substantial downsampling and subsequent Chemical, uh, chemical oxidation or, or shall we say handling in some way, um, which can be a major source of error. Um, and, and that also, uh, perhaps I should mention here, because I actually saw that was a question on that, that also goes for uh, mid-infrared spectroscopy, where the sample amount needs to be really, really small. So, so, so that doesn't relieve the sample prep source of error. Here, NIR spectroscopy is really very unique. But finally, when we are in, 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 in shall we say, in projects where you don't have access to many uh, uh, rep, uh, repetitions of the very same 
uh, field, then the sampling is the by far largest source of error. You have a field which might be one hectare, uh, which might be 100 hectare, it might be one hectare um, or, or much larger. And, and you can only take one or two samples from that, uh, from that piece of land. And obviously recalling uh, some of the uh, pictures I shown, there are a lot of variation there that you simply do not capture uh, using, uh, shall we say, the const or given the constraints that that normally uh, exist in in a normal soil sampling methodology, so I think that's worth to consider uh, that when we talk whether or not a little bit more or less error uh, comes from the reference or the NIR, uh, actually the largest source of error is from the sampling. Uh, perhaps uh, only a few academic studies. Uh, um, solving this but certainly for a production laboratory and for farmers there is no way uh, to handle the soil variability in any way uh, so that this sampling is not the major source of error that's important to recognize so um summarizing um from from fossil's point of view uh, we see that ni spectroscopy for soil is uh, fast and easy to use and cost effective there is a minimum sample preparation, uh, no sample preparation actually beyond the standard, uh, which is conducted, which is sort of the basis for all other uh, tests anyway. Uh, we have tried uh, in FOSS and succeeded, I believe, to make, uh, to, make it as, to make it very easy to get going with uh, database management and calibration development. And uh, for this particular study, it was quite interesting to see that uh, that actually the outliers is a problem that 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 is simply can be, uh, um, if not eliminated, then greatly reduced by the, the soil spectroscopy, probably due to uh, the downsampling problem. Um, I didn't get around to talking about the repeatability, um, so I will skip that point. So in conclusion, uh, we find that NIR is a very suitable technology for handling large amount of soil samples with a high variance. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. Um, I, will, I will share the video here. Yes, please. And that video is, a, shall we say, a demonstration video uh, capturing, uh, shall we say, the product, how to use it. Um, it is just a few minutes long, so it's not a, an in-depth video. In the meantime, uh, Nicola, I think there is a couple of questions in the QA specifically for you or for the force. Can, you can take a look. Hello, my name is Nikolai Borg. I'm a soil application specialist at FOSS. Today, I will talk about analysis of agricultural soils using near-infrared spectroscopy, in particular with our DS2500 analyzer. The soil application package consists of a number of elements. An instrument which will analyze the soil, sample cups containing the actual sample, an application guide which contains all of the elements that are needed in order to develop a calibration, as well as a number of digital services and solutions for data management. The actual measurement of the soil is extremely simple. You open the lid, take the sample cup and place it, Close the lid and press measure on the instrument. While soil management and fertilization is becoming ever more data driven, the analysis methods themselves have actually not involved for a very long time. And while these methods are well recognized and established, there are several drawbacks. Near infrared spectroscopy requires minimum sample preparation and no use of chemicals. This particular sample is being analyzed for its content of organic material termed soil organic carbon. 
Soil organic carbon is a very important parameter and other parameters which can be analyzed includes texture, pH, cation exchange coefficient and total nitrogen. As any other soils entering a soil testing lab, they have been dried overnight at slightly elevated temperatures as well as sieved at around 2 mm to remove branches, rocks, animals and other larger particles. The result is a fine powder which is very well suitable for NIR analysis. In conclusion, near-infrared spectroscopy is the soil analytics methods of tomorrow. It produces vast amounts of data, it is easy, fast and minimizes errors from manual handling. Good. Thank you very much, Julia, for sharing this uh, video. And uh, thanks, uh, yeah. Nicola, and <laughs> thanks, Foss, for preparing uh, this video. I think the, uh, another thing is, I think I just, uh, because of this video, I think some of the colleagues in the chat were asking the price of the instrument, et cetera. And uh, I would uh, suggest, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, if you would like to know more about the company, you feel free to get in touch with the uh, first company or you or feel free to reach me. I, I will be happy to make a bridge, make a link between the countries and the, the manufacturers, not only the first, of course, other manufacturers as well. Um, I, I don't think that today is the, is the proper moment to discuss the price of the instrument and because we will have uh, a lot of uh, interesting discussion uh, be followed and uh, it's been always uh, stressful due to during the presentation period and thanks for Cecilia. Cecilia helped a lot of questions and I can see there is still a lot of questions to answer. Um, we choose some uh, questions uh, to answer live as a discussion and also please also feel free to write your questions in a and a box. Um, in the meantime, uh, Nicola, you also please feel free to some of the questions probably you can type uh, to answer the questions. And uh, the first question actually is talking about uh, one colleague asking, some researchers suggest that MIR over NIR for organic matter clay estimation. The same had been mentioned in the training material sent out by the previous set of uh, webinar. How has been your experience within the same? And I would like to address this question because uh, uh, that training material was developed by us in a close loan in FAO and uh, indeed the, that training material was uh, was a really beginner for really beginner level of uh, uh, colleagues to learn this technology so we introduced the both the visible near infrared and MIR range so we uh, from our experience and existing data and a study we saw mid infrared reflectance spectroscopy in the soil application will have some advantages uh, in terms of a predicted uh, the, the virus of the soil properties uh, and also the accuracies has, ha has some advantages compared to the near infrared spectroscopy. But also, please also be noticed, we also mentioned that each type of the spectroscopy, each range of spectroscopy has their own advantage and disadvantages. So we don't really recommend which range of the spectroscopy you are going to use. And if you have enough resources, we would encourage you to have to equip both range because each of them have their advantage and advantages. And uh, if you don't have enough resources, you have to make a decision depending on your budget and your objectives. So that would be my recommendation. It's very, really difficult to say which one is really better than another one. So. Uh, Can so I then, supplement here? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with, with your uh, answer here. I just wanted to link also to, for example, the aims, which are very important. This is where you should really uh, be clear with yourself. What do you want to use it for? And I showed some examples of using NIR in the field. And if you would like to take an MIR sensor in the field, it would be um, even more uh, prone to the differences in soil moisture. And already NIR has, has its limitation and we have to 
uh, pretreat the spectra to remove moisture effect. Uh, mid infrared range would be even more affected. And even though there are some instrumentations available to do analysis in the field, it's still um, highly actually uh, uncertain. So again, if you would like to go for measurements in the field, you would, for example, choose an NIR. So uh, the first uh, question to answer would be, what would be the, the final uh, application of the sensor you want to um, choose or use? Yes, thanks. Yeah. Maria, there is a one question uh, from Fanny. I think uh, it's quite interesting to ask that on the model, because I, I, I would like to read this question because uh, we are recording this uh, webinar later on. Other uh, participants also can know the question. The question is about the, on a model for macro porosity. It is interesting that you report a better result with NIR than with the Peter transfer function, even though the prediction with NIR was not that good. Do you know what may have caused this? A different scale of a calibration field the scale, national scale, or the representation of influ influential soil property in spectral? Yes, uh, thank you, Fanny, for this question. It is actually a very good question. Um, and I think it goes down to the fact that in Peter transfer functions, we are using um, other um, available soil properties. In this case, for macroporosity, we used silt, sand, and soil organic carbon contents. So these are this is only information about the contents uh, that PTFs are concerning. And not, uh, in in case of NIR spectroscopy. It's not only the contents, but it's also, they are also reflecting the qualitative uh, information of, of these properties. So when it comes to clay, for example, uh, they would also reflect the mineralogy as we have distinct spectral um, uh, responses for different minerals or the same for organic matter. I think that um, it, it's, it's much more to it when we look into spectra because it's not only the contents, but it can also tell us what's the quality. And that's most likely what happened here. So we had, somehow much more information in the spectra than just um, the contents that are used to, to develop Peter transfer functions. Thank you, Maria. Uh, the next question is, Cecilia, you, you would like to answer in live about the, will this course uh, that was mentioned to be organized this year? Yes, maybe I can uh, give the question to Maria. She knows more about that. Yes, of course. Um, so we we actually decided to do this course every second year. So it's not going to uh, take place this year, but we are aiming to do it in the following year. Uh, and um, we can also maybe put a link to the course uh, website in the chat. Um, I have it somewhere here, so I'll send it to you in a moment. Uh, but yes, we'll we'll organize it, and it's and it's a PhD course. But it doesn't have to be. You don't have to be a PhD really to uh, attend it. We had actually some master students as well. We even had um, some. Um, well, it was one lady from a conventional uh, wet chemistry lab where they are interested in introducing spectroscopy. So it's actually um, different types of participants that that we can um, accommodate in, in such a course. So I'll send you a link in a moment in the chat. Yeah. In the meantime, I also would like to address uh, um, Closon Spec is well connected with all the institutions uh, and uh, all the research groups. Once there is any activity related to the training or uh, or, or courses, we will uh, share the information. So please uh, regularly visit our uh, website or Facebook group, etc. And also, uh, I believe uh, FOSS is uh, we have we are discussing with uh, FOSS uh, to see if there is any potential to uh, develop some training program or so to share some uh, protocol because just now has one question I saw uh, they should develop some protocol. So I think FOSS also has a SOP for using the uh, instrument to measure the soil or this uh, I think uh, we need a collective uh, effort to bring this knowledge, transfer the knowledge, expert knowledge to the society. So we still have a lot of work to do in this regard. Um, another question is, uh, Maria, could you explain more about how you did the NIR soil classification map? You select some wave band for this or how you did? 
Yes, thank you for, for this question. Um, no, for this um, exercise, we have used the full visible NIR range. So what we did, we have uh, collected spectra of all the samples that we wanted to include in, in the mapping. And we have performed principal component analysis on the full spectrum. And so what the principal component does, it decomposes this huge matrix into several or fewer um, principal components. And this is what we have mapped. So we have mapped the output of principal components. And these were the PC scores from the first three pieces. So it's, it's, not, it's not the spectra as such, but the actual uh, PC scores. This, I hope it answered the question. I, I can uh, supplement a little bit. Uh, I would like to, uh, I would uh, suggest the colleagues to uh, watch a video recording, I think the webinar three last year from uh, Professor Alex uh, McBrenny, University of Sydney. We had a dedicated discussion uh, during his uh, webinar. And I kind of agree with his opinion for the future application. If we want to use a spectroscopy technology to facilitate the soil classification, uh, one of the approach is because when we do the soil classification, when we classify a soil profile, we need the soil property data of the soil profile. And in order to do that, traditionally, we send the soil samples to the wet chemistry lab to do the wet chemistry analysis, which is very time consuming and expensive. So if we can apply the soil spectroscopy technology to estimate the soil property, different soil properties in a fast and cost efficient way, that will or and then we, we can use this result to classify the soil profiles and then use a classified the soil profile information for the mapping soil classification mapping purposes. That's also another advantage we can take from this uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, Nico, Nicola, Nicola, Nicolai and Maria, any prospect for soil spectroscopy in Africa? Um, well, I can certainly say that, uh, that there are uh, several laboratories in Africa doing soil spectroscopy. And I believe that in uh, Kenya, you probably know that, Maria, there is a, 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 an important center for soil spectroscopy coordinating the whole African region, but perhaps you can tell a little bit more about, about that. Um, do you mean the AFSIS or uh, no, what is it called? Yes, <laughs> I was. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, that's true. I mean, there, there has been actually a lot of activities when it comes to African spectroscopy. Um, and I think it's actually mainly mid infrared range. Uh, I'm not aware of actually um, activities with a near infrared spectroscopy and African soils, but as far as I know, uh... Ethiopia, Ethiopia, they are doing both in there and there. Uh, okay, yeah. And the, the the study that I was referring to at the end of my presentation was actually from Africa. Yeah, yeah, there are some countries that do. Uh, of course, uh, definitely uh, both uh, FBO and uh, research institute and private sector, we should put more focus on Africa because uh, definitely need more resources to help them develop uh, such uh, technology. And uh, one quick question for uh, for Nicola and also for the, fo not question actually, probably is a message it delivered to force. One participant asked, uh, can we do online course from the force? So probably it's uh, it's a message to deliver to FOSS if a FOSS can organize some online training, maybe together with uh, Maria and uh, Glossolon, we can, maybe we can develop something like that. Please uh, deliver this message to the FOSS. Yeah, I mean, we have, uh, we have demonstration videos and, and stuff like that, but it's not really a course as such. They are more like demonstrations. Um, but I think that it's, Perhaps a good idea to uh, to to make a course also uh, in the same, uh, shall we say, uh, with the, with the PhD course, perhaps uh, couple that in some way. Yes, definitely. I think it it would be very nice to to combine it actually and uh, add also your knowledge and information instrumentation um, to such course. Definitely. 
Um, can I can I actually follow up on this PC classification map because yes, there is <laughs> there are so many questions coming. I'm getting a little bit of stress. The yes. Um, so just to follow up, I, I, it seems like it, it was a very interesting um, exercise that I showed. So uh, the question is, which soil properties or property does uh, the PC represent? Um, so again, these were the PC scores. And the only way to know what property they are um, reflecting or what variability they are explaining is by looking into the loadings. So it goes um, a little bit to the basics of, of principal component analysis. And I have showed uh, a plot with um, loadings for those three pieces. And it was clear that, for example, first loading had high um, um, information related to organic matter content the second one to clay content, for example. So this is the way how you can you can um, um, read this sort of hidden information. So you look into the scores and you have to also correspond them to respective uh, loadings in order, in order to make sense out of it. Yeah, so that was just to follow up on the <laughs> classification map. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, Maria, did you, because of this, question constantly coming in. Uh, I don't know if there is any, uh, of, probably we cannot answer all of them. I don't know if there is any particularly you feel uh, interested to uh, Yes, I'm and also Nicola. getting a little bit confused actually. So just give me a second. I will try to pick up at least <laughs> one more. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, one uh, colleague asking to share the share the training material the link uh, i'm sharing to the chat box now so colleagues please feel free to download um now i'm a little bit confused if we did talk about this there is there is one comment on the, the need of uh, protocols for laboratory uh, measurements can, did, can you did please we just that? Can, can you please just read the yes, question? Yes, of course. It's, uh, dear organizers, we need standard protocols for proximal and in laboratory methods. How can we have training course for developing these protocols and experiences for practical, I guess, application? Um, yeah, I think that this is a very good comment and there is already a lot happening when it comes to standard protocols um, and the measurements uh, done with NIR spectroscopy and, and soils. And there is an initiative uh, called IEEE, um, initiated by IR Bendor from Tel Aviv uh, University. Then there are several um, colleagues, um, some spectroscopists are working. There are several work packages that are addressing the issue of, of more standardized way of, of doing the measurements. And we are facing a situation there are already quite, quite many countries um, doing the measurements and everybody has their own protocol on how to do it. And of course, if you would like to, um, in the future, share the data, it would be very useful to have it done in the standardized way. So I guess that, um, yeah, this comment is, yeah, it's actually very relevant and then very much on what is happening right now and the, the different initiatives um, uh, within the, the protocols and, and needs for internal standards and um, similar approaches. Yeah, there is another thing I would like to make a supplement uh, is it uh, Glossolon, it's actually the Glossolon, one of the main Glossolon's mission is to develop this uh, standard protocol for the measurement. However, we have, we, we, we are facing some challenges uh, um, about the, some FAO rules. We are not allowed to uh, mention the, uh, mention any commercial brand to our, any of our publications. Uh, so uh, it's quite challenging for us to publish uh, such documents related to the protocol, et cetera, but we are working on it. And hopefully we will soon to, uh, to figure this out and uh, release uh, some uh, protocol out and get this knowledge and experience uh, to the countries. Uh, one question, actually, uh, Maria, uh, because one question in the beginning, I, I don't want to read because it's quite long, but he asked, how do you see the progress in making soil spectroscopy and soil spectral library use available for application? Probably it's a, it's a very big question uh, globally. It's difficult to answer. That will take days to discussion. Probably you can, you or Nicola uh, can just briefly 
um, say, uh, express something from your perspective, uh, which direction you want to go for the Danish application in uh, five or 10 years uh, go? What is your, in your vision, what will happen in a soil spectroscopy application in Denmark at least? Um, yes, Nicola, do you want so, who's to start? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, um, Foss's, Foss's uh, perspective, we have a, we have certainly have, a, uh, shall we say, the, the, the actions that we, um, and, and the research project we engage with, that is, they are all, have an all, they all have an overall global perspective. We are very much happy for, for this uh, collaboration we have with Aarhus University to, uh, to where, we, where we try new things and we are really innovative uh, in order to, uh, to then to market them to a broader audience. So I really hope that we will be able to, to still uh, get some good ideas and try some, some, some things that are pushing the limits for what is, uh, what is possible. And then uh, our, our role will be to see, well, has this any broader use uh, beyond the, uh, the research world? Um, so I, I will not go into any of specific uh, parameters that Maria will, but I think that, uh, that, that there will be both new applications within this particular uh, type of spectroscopy, but also other types of spectroscopy. Uh, we are, we're having those, shall we say, in our in our portfolio, uh, developing them. And I think we'll see soil applications being uh, having a broader portfolio within FOSS's instruments. Yes, I can supplement from, from our perspective. And of course, I mean, since we are a research institution, we're a university, so it's very much um uh challenging spectroscopy for for different applications but the actual application in real life is of course not really that much a part of what we're doing and this is why again going back what to what you said nikolai that it's so important that we actually establish those collaborations with private sector um, uh, consultancy companies and this is what i could also recommend for others if, if they have a possibility to do it because this is how you can more quickly reach to the end user and this is what we would like at, at the end and when it's only science then of course it takes really years before we can see some some results put in action and yeah by by um, defining some kind of collaboration with private sector that can actually reach also uh, the final um, end user it it it's probably the way to do um and i was actually i was a little bit uh, not sure about the question really because um no i don't see the question it's lost somewhere uh, among the others but i i thought that it was also like how to make sure that we can actually apply um or sort of validate spectroscopy uh, in order to be able to use it wasn't it i think this is what, what was actually the question i think uh, maybe you can search in the answer there because i try to uh, reduce okay. the number of the questions here it's too many so yes okay but then then just to follow up because this is like our, our perspective from from denmark and uh, denmark is relatively a small country uh we can um relatively easy let's say uh, compile a database that it would be representative but for many i guess and and for the use on a global scale the question is how can we actually make sure that uh whatever data we are generating is applicable in other regions of the world so i think also the initiatives that um, Glossoline and Spectroscopy Group is 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 um, representing to sort of join the forces and experience from different uh, scientists, um, shared spectral libraries. That's that's probably the way to go. Thank thank you, Maria. And uh, probably we can we are getting to the end. There is a question. Pro, uh, it's uh, it's also uh, good to discuss is. Uh, what would be the adequate procedure for account the uncertainty of the near infrared spectroscopy model for long run soil organic carbon monitoring experiment? The uncertainty of the, I think the prediction result. That's what he, Marcelo. Uh, I, 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 I can I can comment on that. Um, the uh, that is not easy. Very interesting from a from a for for many, but not easy because the errors are coming from both the NIR being the calibrations, um, which can be uh, which can be identified. I would say that is that is not so hard actually. Um, 
performing normal chemometrics, which I don't know if the if the the person asking the question is familiar with, will reveal many outliers where you have a prediction saying something and then a reference value saying something else. And typically, you will assign that to be the false of the prediction, saying that that is wrong. The hard part that is to identify when you have a false reference method, uh, a reference result. Because that is really the case in real world. If you have many thousand samples, which is not uncommon, or even have many hundred of samples, which is not uncommon for a, a, a study, it is simply from statistics, it is uh, likely, it is most likely that uh, one or more of them will be off by perhaps 50 or even 100% due to some typo or something like that. And I think it's very important to look not only not into the, uh, to the, I mean, to be critical about the reference results also, because when you have that, that can really, that can really be damaging to a calibration. And the only way to do it is to be, uh, yeah, to be critical and to look into the data and to double check, uh, of course, have the samples available for double checking. So I think those are some of the advice I will give um, beyond what is chosen normal with uh, repetitions, um, having good statistics for every sample, being thorough, all these things. Um, yes, uh, if I could follow up, but actually it's maybe something you he can follow up on this because the whole issue of us relying on wet chemistry data, uh, which is, I mean, this is this is what we, we were, we cannot go around in order to make calibration models, we have to have input from wet chemistry. Um, and this is also what Glossolan is, is about, right? And, and the laboratory network uh, where the main aim is to to give some guidelines and standardize the already available uh, wet chemistry uh, analysis so that we at least try to minimize the errors coming from, from, from wet chemistry. So we, maybe you want to follow up actually on that. Yeah, I remember the Maria before we had quite a lot of discussion on this, uh, the wet chemistry, because uh, I think there is one thing very important to be noticed is that uh, uh, soil spectroscopy is highly relied, rel highly relies on the wet chemistry because we need the wet chemistry data for the calibration and later on when we do the validation we also need wet wet chemist relies on the wet chemistry data to do the validation especially during the last 100 years we are rich. we have been relying on the wet chemistry analysis for last 100 for last one or two decades so we truly believe wet chemistry provides us the true value of the soil data, soil samples, but the if but is it really true value of the soil samples or not? I would suggest the colleagues go back to the laboratory, do some soil analysis like a soil texture analysis or even a carbon analysis, and try to use the same sample and repeat doing the uh, wet chemistry analysis, and then you will know what kind of results you will get. And that time you will understand why spectroscopy estimation results from a spectroscopy brings uncertainty. So that's a very, uh, I have to say, it's a very important experience. You, you should uh, go through it if you want to do the spectroscopy. So that's uh, what I would suggest. Uh, uh, Nicola, there is one question from uh, Rafla uh, Atia. Actually, Rafla Atia is a member of our uh, ITPS, and uh, she is from uh, Tunisia, uh, Ministry of uh, Agriculture. And uh, currently, they are planning to develop their own capacities so within their ministry. And uh, she's asking, could you assist the calibration of different instruments, uh, spectral, uh, spectrometer? Uh, because uh, I had a discussion with them, they would, uh, they really would like to have uh, technical support to uh, to build their lab, uh, install the instruments, uh, and uh, train their staff uh, for the measurement from a uh, sample preparation, calibration instrument, uh, export the data, use the data management, etc. I think it's a whole package we are talking. Of course, it's not something we can do it uh, tomorrow. But uh, probably FOSS, uh, it's another message you deliver to FOSS as well. Yeah, um, but uh, in general, our, shall we say, procedure for, uh, for uh, selling and providing instruments, we, are, we, don't, we don't see ourselves as an instrument provider only. We are a solution 
provide us. So when we uh, provide an instrument, which is of course important, then there is a whole package of whatever is needed for the customer to, um, to, to be able to use it actually. And there are these things that I mentioned, some documentation, this and that, but it is also uh, uh, possible to, um, that will have to be arranged with the, with the local uh, FOSS representative to, uh, to uh, have uh, assistance either um, either in person on site or online in, in some way um, to, to uh, enable the user to actually gain the most of the instrument. Um, I cannot go into the detail of this specific case, but it is something that I would say in, in general, yes, but, uh, but, but they will have to talk to their uh, FOSS representative for that. Um, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Nicola. Uh, another question I would like to respond is from Omar. He asked uh, regarding uh, soil organic carbon, uh, do you think this methodology will be able to detect the temporal change of the soil organic carbon? This is something about uh, the uh, soil organic carbon substration potential. And I would like to uh, mention a little bit because I'm working on uh, bo uh, both the soil spectroscopy and the soil mapping part. And uh, in uh, Global Soil Partnership, uh, since last year, uh, two years ago, we initiated a, a global project called Global Soil Organic Carbon Substration Mapping Project. So we are enabling countries to map their soil organic carbon substration potential cross uh, from the past to the future based on the different scenarios. Uh, based on different scenario is uh, uh, business as usual and the sustainable soil management one, two, three, three different scenarios. So based on the different scenarios, you will be able to see what kind of uh, land management based on in for the agriculture, what kind of land management you uh, will affect in the future your soil, soil organic carbon sequestration potential with also uncertainty assessment. But what a spectroscopy can play a role in this uh, topic, because uh, if you want to evaluate, if you want to estimate the future sequestra carbon sequestration potential in the future, then one of the most important uh, input layer for the carbon modeling, carbon sequestration potential modeling is the soil organic carbon map and the clay map. And those maps require a substantial amount of the soil profile data to generate the map. So at that time, if you want a huge amount of soil data to generate such soil map at the national scale, and soil spectroscopy can definitely play an important role for the mapping purposes. So that is uh, my comment. So you are, if you are interested for soil organic carbon sequestration, uh, carbon uh, potential, sequestration potential mapping, uh, project, please also feel free to uh, to visit our website, and we have quite many activities in this regard. Uh, uh, I also added a, a paper that we have published on the use of NIR spectroscopy uh, for monitoring soil organic carbon temporal changes. It's a pa paper by Fan Deng. It's been some years ago. I don't remember the details, but I remember that yeah, we showed that you could actually um yes yeah, since the differences in in sorghum carbon between what was 1980s and i think 2009 so we had two data sets measured uh with spectroscopy from from those two uh dates approximately i don't remember exactly and um yeah so i sent the link and please go ahead you can see in some more details and uh probably the also um let me see, uh, Maria. Uh, probably it's also uh, it's also uh, good uh, in uh, that Facebook group. We have a Facebook group. You can uh, put uh, uh, these uh, your the reference papers to to post there uh, because we have more than one thousand people in this uh, group, and actually most of the participants also join this group. It's uh, and uh, it's also good to populate the information uh, from there. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, you would. We reached the forty-two. We answered the forty-two questions already. I don't know if you, the, if there is anything you would like to. 
Oh, let's see. Um, there's maybe one last question. There's a question, does spectroscopy affect the chemical properties of the soil? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the question. It's probably if the chemical properties are affecting the spect spectrum measurement. I guess that this was uh, what um, what was meant. Yeah, so that's um, it was actually a very good uh, webinar. The first one, I believe, by Bo Steinberg, talking about the fundamentals of, of spectroscopy. But in general, what you can see the sense with NIR spectroscopy would be uh, the molecular bonds of yeah different types: CH, NH, OH, SH bonds. So anything that's related to both organics and, and mineralogy. In short. <laughs> that was the answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if uh, Nikolai, if you have, uh, we reached uh, almost two hours. I think uh, uh, if, I don't know if uh, Nikolai or Cecily, any of you have anything to add uh, on behalf of uh, our discussion? I think I've talked so much already. I must have said it all. <laughs> I don't okay. have anything to add. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for this uh, nice uh, webinar. And uh, I have to say, uh, it's been very active, and it's also always been a very stressful part for monitoring the question. <laughs> and uh, but I think we managed uh, very well. And also, thanks, uh, colleagues, uh, to join this webinar. And also, the timing it's always uh, very difficult because this timing it's always difficult for the colleagues from Asia and the Pacific and also for Latin America, it's very early. And, uh, but we have, we have recorded the video and after editing and then we will upload it to the, um, our website and uh, everyone will be able to watch this again. And also we will upload the, um, all the PPT and the materials. So uh, hopefully we will have uh, more collaboration in the future and to help the countries to develop their capacity and bring this technology to the countries, to the world and uh, facilitate uh, soil monitoring and uh, sustainable management and also in the meantime, advanced uh, science. So thanks again and uh, have a nice afternoon and the rest of the day. Thank you very much once again for the invitation and all the participants for, for great questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye-bye.